year, but I'm going to only take half my papers at, at first and retrieve the others afterwards. Uh, can I be heard? Well, uh, well, of course, Nikos, I am uh, deeply, deeply honored and privileged to be here. Um, I'm, I'm in awe of your previous Ephila lectures, and, uh, and I'm honored to be even thought of in their, in their category. Uh, it's a bit of a challenge to address the question I'm addressing uh, for two reasons here. One reason is, of course, that the folks in the room, most likely by definition, are fully cognizant of all that is happening and may well happen in the future. And relatedly, I don't know that anything having to do with the interface between EU law and international arbitration law hasn't already been said in one fashion or another. So those of us who address the question, practically speaking, we sort of reassemble. Uh, we sort of reassemble the information, um, hopefully in a novel way. Before I get started, I think I should tell you what was the genesis of the take I uh, have on this subject at the present moment. Uh, quite honestly, it comes from a, a discussion at previous Acmea events, um, a statement at several previous Acmea events, that however valuable dialogue would be between the international arbitration community and the European Union community, there is no dialogue, and it doesn't seem that there will be very great prospects for a dialogue. So what does that have to do with my talk? Well, as you'll see, my talk really tries to identify, hopefully constructively, some of the features of European Union policy that I think uh, if revisited, let's put it that way, if revisited would foster um, a better relationship. That doesn't mean there aren't things that the international investment community could do to foster a better relationship, but I think we talk more, much more about what the investor state world can do to reform itself. Uh, in regard to this interface. So I'm going to perhaps be understood or heard to be somewhat critical. That's not really what my goal is. My goal isn't to be critical of the EU. It is to try to identify aspects of the EU policy that if reconsidered, or at least uh, considered, uh, might be a constructive development. Um, I also want to add that um, as I will say, I think, that I have taught EU law for close to 40 years. Um, I know I don't look that old. Um, and international arbitration for close to 40 years. So I feel I have some kind of standing uh, to address the interface. But let me begin. Um, I think it's, I, you all know, it's no exaggeration uh, to describe the relationship um, between EU law and international arbitration law, um, um, or the legal order, if you will, as perhaps the most dramatic confrontation between two international legal regimes that we've seen in a great many years, and possibly ever. Uh, international law scholars frequently lament the fragmentation of international law. You've probably seen that literature on the fragmentation of international law, by which is meant the coexistence of multiple international legal orders that have, um, in actuality or potentiality, overlapping interests and somewhat different policies, resulting in some degree of regulatory disorder. And that has been a theme in the international law literature for some time. Um, but how um, seldom, I would say, however, seldom do the regimes that are the subject matter of that fragmentation thesis, seldom do they collide, at least not in my experience. 
But the two international regimes that are before us today, I think can fairly be described without hyperbole, but you can certainly tell me if I'm being hyperbolic, without hyperbole, as on a collision course. Um, some would say the collision has already occurred, but that's something we can discuss. Um, now, the emergence of what I will call um, more temperately hostilities. Uh, the emergence of hostilities on this scale honestly came as a great surprise to me. At Columbia and elsewhere, as I've said, I've taught EU law and international arbitration law for decades concurrently. I underscore concurrently, albeit in different courses. And over that period, I've written and spoken, as have many others, of course, about the two. But I've always, until relatively recently, regarded them, whether I wanted to or not, as separate and distinct enterprises. Uh, rarely, I found, did teaching, writing, conferencing, ever necessitate or even prompt discussion of both legal orders at the same time. I call it a kind of peaceful coexistence or parallel play, um, if you would prefer that a description. Um, of this pattern, which is simply background to my talk, uh, which is coming to an end, of course, this pattern of, let us call it, peaceful coexistence, um, there is one basic explanation, and this is the background. Um, neither of these two regimes, I think, dealt meaningfully with the matters that were at the core of concern to the other. Of course, that makes it possible to peacefully coexist. Without oversimplification, I hope, in the origins, as I recall, the European Union's preoccupations were construction of the internal market, adoption of a common commercial policy, and development of a certain number of sectoral policies, notably agriculture, fisheries, and of course, competition law. And when you think about it, in none of those matters did international arbitration have much of a role to play and didn't have much at stake, at least so far as I can tell. Indeed, in none of those early enterprises of the European Union was private international law as a whole, of which international arbitration may be regarded as a subset, um, didn't even have at all a serious role to play. And everybody in this room will remember that even when forays were made into private international law, such as the 1968 Brussels Convention, it was thought that that had to be done outside of the structures of the European Union. Indeed, that was inscribed in the treaty, that the member states would separately agree upon a convention on jurisdiction and enforcement of judgments in civil and commercial matters. And we know that the convention and its successors the Brussels Regulation and the Brussels Regulation recast, uh, on top of all of that, contained an arbitration exception, the contours of which are still not perfectly well understood. But that tells you, I think, um, how, relatively speaking, restricted was the sphere of primary concern of the European Union. Now, this changed somewhat with the Amsterdam Treaty in 1997 when private international law broadly construed became um, part of the community pillar um, proper. Um, and now conversely, international arbitration, and remember this is pre-investor state arbitration, it's hard to even imagine pre-investor state arbitration, um, was concerned very little with what mattered most to the EU. Really very little except in the, in the case of, of, of occasional state-to-state -state arbitration, international arbitration's diet in those years consisted almost entirely of contract-based um, commercial uh, disputes. And European Union law would arise, if at all, 
very tangentially, perhaps as a defense uh, to a contract claim of some sort. Um, but what has happened is really um, what we need to say. Now, clearly, the emergence of the tensions that we're seeing between these two international regimes is, and <coughs> frankly, properly, widely attributed to the advent of investor state arbitration. We just take that as a given. Um, I, I, I don't think that can be contested. Uh, that has escalated uh, the tensions. Uh, it represents a quantum shift in the very profile of international arbitration. Uh, and it has, in the polemics that we are witnessing, practically entirely eclipsed um, international commercial arbitration as a factor, even though international commercial arbitration accounts for the vast majority of cases and is not in jeopardy, I don't think, at least not to the extent that investor state arbitration is. Of course, we don't know, and that's a sub-issue in Acmea. Acmea will be the elephant in the room, um, but I will have reference uh, to it. Now I get to my theme, such as it is. With this preoccupation on, understandable preoccupation on and with investor state arbitration, and that phenomenon itself, and the self-examination that investor state arbitration is undergoing these days, I think too often overlooked is, if you will, the somewhat less salient changes or developments that have occurred on the EU side of the equation. The changes on the investor state side of the equation are there for everybody to see, nothing short of the right to regulate, we're told is in the balance. But <clears throat> to what extent are there features of the European Union law that have emerged over the past couple of decades uh, that weren't present in the 50s and 60s um, that have contributed to some degree to the tensions that we're seeing. And I want to emphasize again that my desire to look at the issue from that point of view is a constructive one. It is to identify respects in which European Union law or European Union policy might possibly be recast or adjusted. Um, and that's what I'd like to do. Now, what are those changes or developments in um, EU law? Um, I have three that I want to mention to you. Uh, the first two are very, are relatively circumscribed. They are, they are quite specific, they're circumscribed, and they do not compare to, I think, what we'll get to when I get to my third. So I don't want to exaggerate the importance of these two, but they're there. The first of these is, as everybody in this room knows, is or was the EU's conscious and ambitious and intensive campaign to enact regulations and directives establishing new legal norms in a wide range of private commercial relationships. Relationships that are the stuff of international commercial arbitration. Of course, so great was the volume of the legislation to which I'm referring that the European Union, of course, developed, and we won't discuss it, the principle of subsidiarity that may or may not have um, seriously addressed the problem. But so great, and I observed this over the years, so great was the volume and range of EU-level legislation in private law into which the EU had not previously ventured, as I indicated, product liability, com a commercial agent protection, regulation of lawyers, uh, truth and advertising, and so on, that um, represented 
a development of EU law that placed EU law potentially in the orbit of international commercial arbitration, whether as the basis of a claim or as the basis of a defense. Now, a second and very closely related and probably more important development, concurrently with the one I've just mentioned, <coughs> was the EU's embarking on an equally vigorous campaign favoring the private enforcement of EU competition law. No secret to folks in the room. Uh, and there should never have been any doubt that violation of EU competition law might operate as a defense to a commercial contract claim. But of course, the European Court of Justice is echo Swiss case, with which I think probably everybody in the room is familiar, laid uh, any doubt uh, to rest um, that competition law, uh, the increased salience of competition law in uh, disputes as a claim or a defense um, was happening. What do these two, before I get to my third, what do these two somewhat slender, uh, admittedly slender developments have in common? And what they have in common, I think, is the fuel they gave to a rather powerful notion that we take for granted today, but did not at the start, the notion of European Union public policy. The emerging notion of EU public policy, quite honestly, cast EU law in a new and different light in international arbitration circles, just as it cast international arbitration in a new and different light in EU circles, both in ways that might not have been immediately apparent. Now, I don't have to tell this group that the notion of public policy um, is nothing new across jurisdictions around the world. It is meant to denote values that are deemed so fundamental to the health, morals, well-being, generally speaking, of a social, political, and economic order that they cannot be trumped by word, they cannot be trumped by deed, they cannot be trumped by party agreement, they cannot be trumped by a choice of forum clause or a choice of law clause or even the operation of choice of law principles. Perhaps not viewing the EU early on as quite yet a polity. We don't know what the EU is, of course. Um, but, <laughs> but I don't think, I think it can be described as a polity. That's a sufficiently vague term um, <laughs> that it applies. Uh, and so, not viewing the EU in the early years as not quite yet a polity, maybe it was understandable that the Court of Justice was not quick to posit a notion of EU public policy. For decades, I promise you, and you may know, the term didn't appear. It simply didn't appear. But with the two developments that I've just mentioned, the enactment of a volume of private law legislation that the EU thought of sufficient public interest to warrant legislative intervention, and the um, uh, emphasis on EU competition law, the notion of EU public policy has certainly come to the fore. Now, I don't want to dwell on the Echo Swiss case, but I think it is emblematic of how this presented itself. Um, there you'll recall uh, the Court of Justice, while um, acknowledging that competition law claims and defenses were arbitrable, much as the U.S. Supreme Court did in the Mitsubishi case, those awards in that field, competition law, were nevertheless subject to some degree of special scrutiny, exceptional scrutiny, so that we know from that decision, if an arbitral tribunal were to fail to entertain a competition law claim or defense, a national court hearing a challenge to the resulting award was required, and now is important, as a matter of EU public policy to annul the resulting award, even if the competition law claim or defense was inexcusably never raised during 
the course of the arbitral proceedings. Now, you know that while Echo Swiss 